Okay, well, I guess we'll get started. Um, so, I should send an email about this. The first announcement is that uh, the final deadline for everything about the project, including the write-up slides, etc., is this Sunday, and that cannot be extended because the last four lectures are going to be student presentations, which means they're starting next Tuesday, which means we need Monday to actually look them over, which means Sunday midnight is the final, final, final deadline. No more um, extensions. So what I need is the code in GitHub, the LaTeX report, the slides for the presentation, your research doc, and the data sheet um, needs to be ready. And uh, today, uh, I'm going to, in our last lecture, I'm going to finish talking about reinforcement learning by um, describing how neural networks uh, can be used in the picture. Uh, so before I get started on that, any questions? Okay. So, so far we have seen uh, Markov decision processes, the Bellman equations, the expectation equation, the optimality equation, and algorithms based on those Bellman equations, uh, what are called dynamic programming algorithms of policy iteration and value iteration basically uh, use uh, the model to do the necessary updates. And then um, with model-free methods, we found out that you can actually have the uh, Monte Carlo samples or TD samples in order uh, to, to direct uh, sort of approximations to these equations to perform reinforcement learning. These. So how can we use um, neural networks in this picture? Uh, the first and most obvious way is to use a neural network to approximate a value function, okay, V or Q. Um, so, so far we basically always treated value functions as tables, so for every state in, term, in the case of V and for every state action pair in, in the case of Q, we store one value and then we update these values to, um, to uh, match what we want. But that way of doing things is impossible if your state space is big. For example, in Go, you know, this state space is not, uh, is uh, too large to keep explicitly. And, uh, or if your actions are continuous, like in the case of a robot. So what I'm going to do This market processes policy value function, key value function, these are all sort of uh, things that we've seen already. Okay. And then here um, is basically a value iteration. Um, and why it's basically not uh, possible to scale this to large problems, right? So here is the Bellman optimality equation. So, um, or an update based on the Bellman optimality equation. So QI is our current guess. QI plus one is going to be our next guess. So we're going to set QI plus one for the current state action pair as the expected value of the reward plus the discounted um, value of the next, next um, state action pair. However, this requires an entry for Q for every state action pair, which is basically not feasible. <clears throat> so, can we actually use a uh, neural network to represent um, the action value function? So, um, this theta here represents the parameters of the neural network. This neural network is going to take S and A as inputs um, and give us the, give us the value uh, for this particular state action pair. Um, an alternative implementation is to take just the state as input 
and give out values for every possible action. You have a finite number of actions. Uh, we'll, um, we'll, uh, we'll see both of them used. And uh, if this queue is basically a deep neural network of the type that we've learned, uh, this is called deep queue learning. Um, how can we actually uh, train these neural networks? Well, uh, we want to find the Q function that satisfies the Bellman equation. This is the Bellman optimality equation, notice the max here. So we want this to be satisfied for every state action pair. Um, so what we want to do is define a loss. And the loss is defined in terms of um, our current estimate of the value of the state action pair, depending on our um, parameters data. And uh, the expression, this yi represents uh, the, the target value. The target value is basically the expectation of the immediate reward plus the discounted future value. Okay? So we take this thing inside the expectation as our target value, we calculate Q uh, for the current state and action pair using our current uh, neural network um, parameters, and we define loss as the squared loss between these two values, since the purpose here is not to estimate probabilities or uh, classes, but it's actually to estimate values. Uh, the natural loss function to use in this case would be the uh, squared loss. It's, uh, it's more of a regression problem. Okay? So, 30 seconds for questions. The notation might be a bit different from the uh, previous lecture, so if there's anything you don't understand, please ask. <coughs> So once you basically make the thing here your target, the problem resembles a supervised learning problem, right? So S and A are inputs, and the expected reward plus uh, future value is the intended output that the Bellman optimality equation would satisfy. So you basically tweak the parameters of your Q to get its value to, uh, to more closely resemble the target. And then the backward pass consists of the gradient update for the thetas. This gradient upset, uh, the, the gradient update um, gets the Q values closer to their intended targets as indicated by the Bellman optimality equation. <coughs> okay. So, um, I guess the the work that made this deep Q learning uh, famous is the Atari um, problem where we basically learn how to play Atari starting from raw pixels. Um, has anybody seen this work before? Okay, so then um, let me describe the uh, problem and the model and then I'll show a little video. Um, So, um, in this case, we want to use reinforcement learning to train uh, a agent to play old Atari games. Uh, these are things like Pong, you know, Breakout, uh, Space Invaders, etc. These classic games that I used to play when I was a kid. Um, and we want this learning to take place in a fairly um, starting from a blank slate type of position. So. Uh, we don't have a, the notion of um, you know, spaceships or balls or physics or anything. We basically start with the input being just the pixel values on the screen. Um, the actions 
correspond to joystick actions, left, right, fire, etc. And the only rewards that we basically recognize are the score increases or decreases in response to our actions. Okay? And we start with a random uh, queue network that basically knows nothing and we train it using the uh, updates that we saw in the previous um, slide. So here's a bit more detail uh, for the Q network. So the current, the Q network basically um, takes the current state as input. The current state is represented as a stack of last four frames uh, to sort of indicate where the uh, which direction the uh, game pieces are traveling so we we don't just take the last screenshot but the last four screenshots um, and we we do some processing on them grayscale conversion downsampling cropping etc and then we pass it through a fairly standard convolutional network of the type that we've seen before so we have 16 8x8 eight eight convolutions with uh, stride 4, 32 4x4 four four with stride 2, fully connected layer of 256, and then the final layer is fully connected layer with four outputs. So in this architecture, um, A, the action, is not the input to the Q network, but it's one of the. Um, the Q network produces um, scores for each action in its output. Okay, so the state is the input. But as we know, the Q function assigns a score to a state action pair. So this Q network basically assigns scores to every action from this state. Okay, so one pass through this network, and we know uh, the scores of all the actions. Questions? Okay, fairly simple network. So input state, convolutional layer, and then four actions for the output of the four. Um, scores. Yeah. So the, the we are trying to uh, estimate the score via a neural network. The, the Q function. function. Yeah, mm -hmm. We're trying to estimate the well. We have a neural network representing the Q function, okay. and we train this Q function using the Bellman optimality, the Q learning updates, which basically means you. You update the Q function to resemble uh, or to come closer to the immediate reward plus the future value. That's the Bellman optimality equation. Right? I was going to ask that for me. When we do a good action, uh -huh. our score isn't going to increase. It's going, it's going to have a lag. That's true. That's true. So credit assignment is a problem that this guy needs to solve. I mean, similarly, when you're Traveling in a maze, you know, your good actions leading up to the treasure might be, you know, far in the future, but the current step is making progress toward that action. That is a common problem to all reinforcement learning. But yet we expect the different uh, Q values uh, assigned to these different states to feed back into each other to inform neighboring states and actions uh, about who's responsible for. Uh, this score increase. Okay. Um, set that. Okay. So here is the previous slide again, more precisely, exactly how we train this thing. Okay. So what we want. So the only thing that's coming from the game is this R. If you notice, right? So, so Q is the neural network. So we use the neural network uh, to estimate a value for the current state action pair. When we're doing that, we consider the next state that we go to and what action we would take in that next state, right? And we use the same network uh, to find the maximum uh, valued action in that next state. And then we use this immediate reward plus the discounted next value as our target, as if we're doing supervised learning. So we say, I want my Q network to assign the current state action pair a value that is close to 
the immediate reward the plus the discounted future value. Okay. So this yi here, my target corresponds to Im immediate reward plus the discounted future value. That's q learn. <coughs> Um, so, and this works. I'll, see, I'll show you some examples. Uh, it actually uh, achieves superhuman performance on more than half of the games. Uh, one trick that they used to train this thing is uh, if, you, if you just use Q-learning um, online as you're playing the game, what ends up happening is that the consecutive states are correlated. Right, so there is certain some problems involved with um, training using correlated uh, samples. You're only so for example, in a particular stage of the game, you're only exploring a particular uh, set of states, um, and not that might actually destroy what you learned for other um, phases of the game. So what you want to do. Uh, the, to prevent this is called experience replay. So since we said uh, once you collect these uh, future immediate rewards and the next values as your target values, the problem is very much like supervised learning. So why don't we store these supervised learning instances in a buffer that we call the replay buffer? And why don't we shuffle this buffer around and um, train using random mini batches from this uh, replay memory. Okay, so instead of training using the immediate state and the following state, uh, we basically pick um, a random mini batch from our experience buffer in order to do weight updates, which destroys this um, correlated sample problem <coughs> and bad feedback loops. For example, if you know you. Um, you, you like a particular type of move because of some random weights in your neural network, you keep making that move and then that prevents you from experiencing any other moves during that stage of the game. So these problems can be de dealt with um, generating a buffer of um, state action and target value. So how do we do this exactly? Um, we, we have a replay memory which is basically a table of transitions that we have experienced. So we basically say, oh, I was in state S and my network at the time took action A. And in response to this state and action, the environment gave me a particular reward and sent me to a particular other state. Okay? So this is one unit of experience. And whenever we try something else, another state action pair, we record these things um, in our buffer, replay memory. And then we train our network using random media batches from this replay memory. So the whole uh, algorithm looks like this. So I'm going to go over this in some detail. So we start by um, initializing the replay memory to nothing. The Q network is set to you know, some random weights. Uh, and then we play M episodes. These are full games that we play with the existing um, Q network. Um, so the state is initialized to the starting position of the game, uh, the screen pixels at the start of the game, at the beginning of each episode. Um, and this phi is basically a, uh, our network that produces the representation for this state. So we process these pixels using a CNN. So the final uh, the features that we get out of it is this phi. So and then for at each time step that we're going to take an action, uh, first of all, remember that in Q learning we want to do um, epsilon greedy action selection. If you only do greedy action, action selection, um, that's not good. So that means with probability epsilon, we select a random action. We don't look at our network. Okay, so that's epsilon greedy. 
Otherwise, we select the ideal action uh, according to our current Q network. Okay, the highest scoring action according to our current Q network. And then we execute the action in the game emulator. Uh, and in response, we get a reward and the next image. Right? So the reward is basically the change in score. It might be going up, you know, higher or lower. Um, and the next screen image comes up. Okay? So um, this basically gives us a quadruple to store in our replay memory. So phi t is the representation of our current state. Uh, a t is the action that we just took. And then the environment gave us RT and phi t plus 1. So that quadruple uh, gets stored in our replay memory. Okay. And then, instead of using the last, uh, uh, last quadruple to do the training, we basically do experience replay, which means we sample a random mini batch of transitions from our replay memory uh, for training. Okay. So when we have a quadruple like this, state, action, reward, next state, that means our target, what we use for our target is either the reward, if the state is a terminal state and the game ended, so there is not nowhere else to go, or more generally, reward plus uh, the discounted future value, which is exactly uh, the next state in the quadruple and the maximizing action that we would take in that state. And the value of that state action pair um, determines our target. So that's yj, the target value that we should have. So, and uh, my current q gives this value, so I try to minimize the difference between yj and this q uh, using gradient descent. Question? I don't understand. I mean, why does uh, we, we select a random action from the epsilon? Correct. And with epsilon, I mean, with, with some possibility, it's going to be something that's just very good and it's going to have a very high grade, like a very big gradient and we able to shift uh, that, that kind of shift to that uh, in our uh, decisions. So with, with some probability, the random action is going to be very good? Yes, it's going yes. to be better than... So that's why we're exploring, yeah. Why doesn't that take care of the correlation thing? Uh, why do we need to go and randomize experiences? So when you're playing a game, um, the game has correlations that go over time. So the beginning of the game, so let's say chess, okay? In the beginning of the chess game, the opening phase is very different from the middle game, which is very different from the end game. Okay, so during the first moves, you're always in the opening phase. The pieces are arranged according to their original positions. So that's a particular set of states that you're exploring. And if you keep hammering your network with updates from those set of states, that could affect adversely how your network does on some other set of states. So you don't want to keep hammering your network with similar examples when you're training. You want to mix and match the different examples sampled from the whole space of game states um, in order to improve learning efficiency. And the, the claim is not that if you didn't do this, it wouldn't converge. It would probably converge, but take much longer. Okay. So this is the same reason in supervised learning we shuffle our training sets. So for example, if you have a binary decision problem, and let's say the way it comes to you, all the positive example, all the one million positive examples is in the beginning, and all the one million negative examples is at the end. If you don't shuffle that, and if you try to train a neural network, for the first million examples, it's going to say positive to everything. And for the, for the next million, it's going to learn to say negative to everything. Okay. Eventually, it might discover that the output actually depends on some features of the input, but it's going to take it a lot longer to learn that compared to shuffling the data first. 
So same concept here. So can we say that, I mean, maybe it's pushing it a little too far, but if we were to, I mean, what's generally a ballpark number for the number of episodes? Uh, it's all in the paper, actually. So the paper has results. Actually, I have slides for that, too. But they have results comparing with and without experience we play. How effective it is. Both in the slides um, from David Silver and the original paper itself. So it's an efficiency issue, learning efficiency. Okay, so let's uh, let's watch how we do. I don't know if there's any sound. We don't need any sound. So. The agent is given only the raw sensory input, which is the pixels. Uh, there is no domain knowledge, so the, uh, the agent doesn't know what a ball is, what a paddle is, what it's controlling on the screen. So this is after 10 minutes of training. The goal is to hit the ball to break the wall up there. And in the beginning, it's, it's pretty bad. It misses the ball most of the time. So this is worse than a uh, novice human player, I guess. That was after 10 minutes. Now we're going to see after two hours of training, uh, it's basically catching the ball almost all the time. So at this point, it's it's playing at a level of a, probably an expert human player. Um, and after four hours of training, uh, it actually discovers something that the designers of the program didn't know about, which is if you dig a tunnel uh, on one corner and send the ball up, it will basically keep eating the wall from up there without you doing anything. Okay? So it actually develops, uh, it, it discovers that strategy on its own with only the raw supervision from the game scores. Okay, okay so that was, uh, uh, that was the idea of representing the value function with a neural network. Uh, a totally separate idea is representing the policy with a neural network. Okay, remember what a policy was. A policy is basically a probable distribution of actions given the state. Okay, so instead of going through indirectly through this Q value, why don't we actually have a neural network that takes a state and that assigns probabilities to actions? So that's that's a policy network. It's called a policy network. And if we can find a way to directly train that network, it might actually be more efficient uh, in learning, uh, especially in in problems where the Q function might be very complicated because after all, all we want to learn is basically the correct action uh, corresponding to every state. Okay, so what would be our um, training target? So here's our policy, parameterized policy. Uh, theta is the um, weights of our neural network. And the goal is to maximize this, right? So for example, this is basically the future, total cumulative future rewards discounted by gamma. So the expectation of this, we need the expectation because there is a lot of randomness associated with us choosing actions, the environment giving us different rewards and different states. So we need the expectation to take care of that uncertainty. But this is our goal, if we could actually uh, find a training procedure that will maximize j of theta, uh, it would give us the ideal policy. Okay? Any questions except how, how we do this, which I'm going to explain next? So in order to maximize this j theta, I need to find the gradient with respect to theta. Okay? So that's, that's the that's what I'm going to spend the next couple slides doing. I have a neural network, I have an objective function, but it's not clear how 
um, the parameters of the network actually affect the objective function because there is a lot of there is episodes, there is uncertainty associated with episodes, etc. Okay, so if I can find the gradients, I can just use my regular tricks to maximize or minimize functions to a local optimum. So the, the, uh, this idea is known as the reinforce algorithm. Um, so mathematically, we can write this experience, uh, we can write this uh, expectation as an integral. So let me define everything for you. So j of theta is the network parameters. j is my objective function that I'm trying to maximize. This expectation is taken with respect to tau, which is the whole um, um, episode. Okay, And this episode has been sampled um, according to some probability distribution. This probability distribution reflects my um, model, you know, how the environment gives me rewards and transitions me to other states, as well as my policy, which is determined by theta. And R of tau is basically the cumulative reward for the whole episode. Okay, so I want to maximize my cumulative reward for the whole episode. And this expectation can be written as this integral. Right, so here R of tau is the reward of a trajectory, which I called episode, it's called, also not called the trajectory. And the trajectory is basically state zero action, zero reward zero, state one action, one reward one, etc., until the end of the episode. Okay? So this is the thing that I want to maximize, this integral. Any questions? So far so good? Okay, so um, what is the gradient of this integral with respect to theta? Well, the gradient is a linear operator that can be pushed into the integral. Um, R of tau is, has no theta in it. This is basically, this is an integral over all possible trajectories. The reward for that trajectory times the probability for that trajectory, right? So the reward for that trajectory has nothing to do with theta. So I can basically um, assume that, you know, consider that as a constant and push the gradient in. And I have this p, the probability of this trajectory, which obviously depends on theta, because the trajectory depends on the actions I'm taking. Unfortunately, this integral uh, is intractable. So if your probability uh, depends on theta uh, the, in an expectation formula, then we can't differentiate this. However, there is a standard um, algebraic trick or calculus trick which will allow us to uh, differentiate this. So here's the trick. So this is the gradient of the probability of this trajectory, the gradient with respect to theta, which is this term in here that I'm tr that's giving me trouble. So what I do is I basically multiply it and divide it with the same uh, p tau. Okay? And what that gives me is basically this thing. And this is basically gradient of p divided by p. And that's simply gradient of log p. Okay? And then the thing that I multiplied here still stays there. So any, any step of this trick that you don't understand, except why we're doing it, which I'm going to explain next. So mathematically, it makes sense. So we multiply, divide by the same term, which turns it into this thing. So now if we replace this thing instead of this thing, this is the expression we get. Okay. And uh, in this expression, I got my raw, undifferentiated p of tau d tau again. So that means uh, this integral is the actual e expectation of whatever is inside this parenthesis, right? So this is a function of theta uh, with some probable, according to some probability distribution. So I can write that as an expectation again. So this integral is the expected value with respect to random trajectories of uh, the reward for that trajectory 
and then the gradient of log p. Okay? So once you get here, then you can say, oh, you know, this is the expectation of something I can compute. Uh, let me just estimate this expectation using Monte Carlo sampling. How do I do that? I have data. I can generate trajectories. So I can generate 10 examples of th this, you know, 10 t different tiles, let's say. And I know the reward of each one of them. I can calculate the uh, gradient with respect to log p for each one of them. And these can act as samples uh, from this probability distribution, then, which I can then use to estimate this integral. Usually, in these types of estimations, very few um, examples are uh, usually sufficient to get a good enough uh, approximation. Questions? If you understand this trick, that's, that's pretty much the whole reinforced algorithm. So J was that expectation at the top. The gradient of J is this expectation at the bottom. And in order to update J, update theta, sorry, to in, in, increase J, I need to step in the direction of this uh, gradient. And it turns out I can estimate this gradient. Since it's an expectation, I can estimate this gradient by generating random trajectories using my current theta and then calculating that thing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this, the whole idea is, I don't know the transition probabilities because I don't have the model. All I have is the pi, my policy. I know the probabilities of that. So uh, this is the probability of a particular trajectory, which is basically probability of each state transition and the probability of me taking that particular action for all time. I know what this is, but I don't know what this is. Um, so when we take the log of this whole thing, uh, we can basically write this as uh, sum of two logs. And when I differentiate this thing, um, differentiate the gradient of, uh, differentiate log p, um, which is equal to this thing, the first term disappears. Why? Because it doesn't actually have theta in it, right? So the part that I don't know, the part that comes from the model, the part that basically affects my state transitions, actually disappear when I take a gradient because it, it doesn't depend on theta. And I'm taking gradient with respect to theta. So the gradient of the first part is zero. The gradient of the second part is a function that I do know. This is my neural network, computing probabilities for um, actions given states. And I, I can certainly differentiate that with respect to theta. Okay? So that means um, so this was the thing that I was actually trying to calculate at the top which I said is an expectation, and this expectation is the reward for the trajectory and the gradient of log p. And here I basically argued that the gradient of log p can be calculated without knowing anything about the model, without knowing these state transition probabilities, because these state trans transition probabilities do not affect, um, the, the, are not affected by theta. So Long story short, I can basically replace this thing uh, with this thing. So the gradient with respect to log p gets replaced with the gradient with respect to log pi for every action that I took throughout this trajectory. Okay? Okay, I'll hold a minute for questions. Pi is a neural network, and theta is its parameters. So I already know how to do that, right? So, um, 
pi is a neural network that assigns a probability to every action in this state. The state is its input. The action probabilities are its output. And this is saying, for this particular action AT, what was the gradient with respect to theta? So what, what changes would increase, increase the probability of AT the most, right? So that's the standard you know, neural network gradient question. Why does the logarithm of a gradient of a logarithm makes it easy? A um, couple of things. Uh, one, it turns this multiplication into an addition. Okay? And as soon as you turn it into an addition, when you take the gradient of a sum, it's the sum of the two gradients and one of them disappear. Right? So that's one. And then because of the trick that we saw in the previous slide, um, which basically allowed us to express this thing as an expectation with respect to P uh, probability of the trajectories so that we can actually estimate it using Monte Carlo sample trajectories. And in particular, this is um, estimating it using one trajectory. Right? So um, I mean normally, Monte Carlo sampling, you would maybe sample 100 trajectories and take the average, etc. But here it's basically saying after each trajectory, you still have some estimate. And if you add up the reward for this trajectory uh, with the gradient of log pi, then that's basically an estimate of the gradient of j, an unbiased estimate of the gradient of j. So you can use that to update your parameters. Okay, so what does this do? Let's look at this and try to understand um, this formula. So in which direction would it push our parameters? Right, so if for a given trajectory tau, we just played the game once, and we have a cumulative reward of r tau. Um, and uh, the, the gradient with respect to theta of the objective function is basically this thing. So basically that means if r tau is positive and high, what it's going to do is it's going to push uh, the probabilities of the used actions up and if r tau is negative, low, it's going to push them down. That's pretty much what, what it's doing. Okay. So even though this might uh, seem simplistic, um, it actually works. Um, even though to say, you know, if a trajectory ha has given me a positive reward, all its actions should be good. That's sort of naive. It's probably not uh, true most of the time. But in expectation, uh, good actions seem to accumulate um, probability on average. However, um, this particular uh, estimator is not the most efficient we can use. It has, it's unbiased, so if we, um, if we collect enough of these things, it will eventually converge to the right uh, value. However, it is uh, high variance. So um, most of the research on policy gradient learning focuses on trying to find estimators of this gradient that are lower variance. And we're going to see a couple of them now. So, so this is my, my gradient estimator. How can I re reduce its variance? Well, one thing, one idea is um, Notice that in this original formulation, uh, every action is getting pushed in the direction indicated by the cumulative reward for the whole trajectory, okay, from beginning to end. 
but we do we know that this particular action actually affects only the later part of the trajectory that comes after t right so at only affects the trajectory that comes after t so instead of taking the whole reward we can take the cumulative reward that comes after t because that's the part that's affected by this particular action and use that in order to uh, push the probability of at up or down so that's one trick that will um, reduce the variance of this estimator. Uh, another thing is, in order to do better credit assignment, we can use our discount factor gamma. So presumably, AT affects the rewards that are closer to T than that are further away from T. So this, uh, putting this gamma factor in here and uh, discounting the future rewards more might actually help um, the variance of the estimator as well. So what we want to do is we want to change the probability of this particular action AT uh, in proportion to its effect on our reward, which unfortunately we don't know, right? Because there's delayed rewards, there's you know moves that you make now that actually give you a result uh, 10 seconds from now. Because of that, it's very very hard to um, pinpoint exactly the credit each action deserves. So the original uh, formula says, oh, you know, I can't do credit assignment, so I'm going to use the reward for the whole trajectory as a guide for how to improve, increase or decrease the probabilities of the actions that I've done. And these other ideas basically try to make it more specific uh, to this action by taking the rewards following the action or the discounted rewards following the action. <coughs> Another um, problem is that in the formula, if the reward is positive, then the probabilities of the actions that we have uh, performed in that particular episode will all go up. Okay. Now let's imagine a game where all, you know, we only actually have positive scores. So that means no matter what the episode is the probabilities of the actions in that particular episode are always going to be pushed up. Now in the long run, this will sort of average out because eventually you, you know, because of the epsilon greedy, you will perform some other actions and they'll give you higher scores and then those, you know, probabilities will be pushed up uh, more, etc. But it's not the most efficient um, way to do it. So what we want to do is, um, instead of saying, the direction in which this probability should move um, should depend on the sign of the reward. Uh, we should say the direction in which this probability should move should depend on whether or not this reward is better than we expected or worse than we expected. So there should be a baseline. Instead of zero, we should use this B baseline, which we can discuss how to assign this baseline later. But this B of ST represents what we were expecting at this state, if we were expecting 100 points and we end up getting 90, those moves were actually bad. So we should push them down instead of up. Okay? So that's the baseline idea, which also will help uh, reduce our variance. Next question is where these baselines will come from. Uh, there is some you know, simple ideas like we can take the moving average of all the rewards experienced so far as a baseline. So this is the, you know, for each game, this average might be different. So we can take the average out. Um, however, a more sophisticated idea is uh, instead of taking averages, we should make it state specific. So in particular, we should really ask what was the expected value of what I, I get from this state, right? So that's, that's what we really want to ask. And, and what is that? What is the answer to that question? So what is the expected future value from this state? When you ask for the expected future, expected value what we, expected value of what we should get from that state. Mm -hmm. To the end. Yeah, that's just a 
function. That's just a value function, right. So when we first started being forced, we said, oh, let's get rid of the value functions and let's just have a policy network and let's try to optimize the policy network. But now we see that if we did also have a value function, then we can use that as a baseline uh, in order to uh, make our updates to the policy network more efficient, okay? Reduce the variance even more. So that's exactly right. So that brings us to um, a mixed type of model, which are called the actor critic models, um, which represent both the policy as a neural network and the value function as a neural network. Okay? So, in the beginning of the class, we talked about EQ learning, which represented the Q function as a neural network and tried to learn using value iteration, using the Bellman equation. Bellman optimality equation. That we saw reinforce, which basically said, let's turn the policy into a neural network and train it using policy gradients. And now we see that if we actually use both of these things together, uh, we can actually do better. So um, what do we exactly want to do? Um, when are we happy with an action AT in a state ST? Well, we're happy with it if um, the Q value of STAT is um, better than the expected value out of ST. Okay? So the, the, um, from this state ST, the, the expected value after taking the action, taking this action, happens to be better than sort of the average value we would get from this state. Right? So this is the term we want to use as a baseline. Or is it so instead of the reward for the whole trajectory or reward for the future moves or the reward discount reward for the future moves, etc., etc., we basically put in this uh, difference. How much better was my action compared to all the actions out of this state? Q minus V. Okay, so this is also called the advantage term. Okay. So now we have a pi which we represent with a neural network, as well as uh, Q and V, which we can represent with neural networks as well. And this is known as the actor critic algorithm. So, so this was basically the formula to train our pi function, but how can we train our Q function, or the value V function? Well, the answer is Q learning, right? So, to train the Policy, which is called an actor in this case, uh, we we learn policy. We use policy gradients, and to to train the value functions, the Q function, which is called the critic in this case, uh, we use Q learning, just like we did before. So we have two neural networks. The actor network decides which action to take, representing the policy. The critic, uh, which represents the Q value, tells the actor how good its action is compared to, you know, randomly picking an action or um, sampling an action, which tells the um, actor how to adjust its weights. <coughs> um, this, the second point here basically says, normally when we were doing Q learning, Q learning was responsible for learning all possible state action pairs and values for them. Here, the critic which we also train using Q-learning, has an easier job because it doesn't have to learn the whole space. It only has to learn um, these QSAs for the actions that are encountered during uh, the uh, policy network's uh, trial. So if, if the policy network never chooses a particular set of actions or never visits a particular set of states, the critic network doesn't have to learn about them. Okay? So it only has to learn enough to give the um, policy network uh, some feedback. Isn't that bad? What do you want to see if there's something over there? I guess the assumption here is that the policy network, even without this, converges to the 
right policies, right? So it, it's, it tends to learn the right moves to maximize the scores. We're just making it more efficient by giving it this uh, critic network. So, um, so that means uh, it's, it's learning can only get better, right? It's not going to get any worse. So the, this is definitely more efficient than just rewarding every action by the overall reward of the trajectory. Um, of course, this can be combined with everything we learned before, experience replay, for example. And uh, uh, typically this Q minus V thing is called the advantage function. And we can learn this advantage function directly as a neural network. Okay, so that's called actor critic. And uh, so here's sort of the high level pseudocode for the actor critic. Oops. Um, so we have, we sample M trajectories under the current policy. So the policy parameters are theta, the critic parameters are phi. Okay, so we sample a bunch of trajectories, and for each time step, we calculate. Uh, this value, which is the advantage function, and we let this advantage function determine the gradient or the update for the actor or policy parameters theta. So uh, this gradient of log, log probability of action given state is familiar to us already, and we're basically multiplying it with this action um, term that we learned using that, okay? Um, and we also, you know, do an update to our five parameters, the critic parameters using Q-learning, uh, and then we update both. So one nice example of this uh, working uh, is the RAM model, recurrent attention model. So in this model, instead of trying to recognize, let's say, MNIST digits in one shot using a single um, pass through a convolutional neural network, we simulate glimpses. So glimpses are these little windows um, that are sort of um, inspired by human perception. When you're looking at a scene, you don't take the whole scene at once. Your eyes keep scanning the uh, scene, looking at different points and in incorporating that information. So can we actually have a neural network with a very small fovea that can look at small patches of the image, but we can give it sort of multiple glimpses over this image, and uh, can we train this uh, network both to control the glimpse, so where to look, and to um, recognize the image at the end. Um, the reason we need reinforcement learning for this is that each glimpse action is non-differentiable. Okay, so unlike soft attention mechanisms where we multiply all the pixels with some Gaussian or something, a glimpse basically cuts out a window at a particular location. And that's a discrete action that is not differentiable. Um, and that when things are not differentiable, we can't use regular supervised learning tricks. We have to fall back on reinforcement learning. Um, so the, the way the model works is basically uh, using an RNN to organize these glimpses. So the input image comes in. Here's the glimpse, the random glimpse that we start looking at. It's completely black, so the, this is the input to the neural network. So there's some maybe convolutional network or maybe for a simple problem this could be a fully connected uh, couple layers. And at the end of the calculation, this network tells us where to look next. So x1, y1 is the next glimpse location. Uh, so we choose the exact location using some, sort of some you know, um, Gaussian centered at x1, y1. Okay, so let's say the next location is this, the tail of 2. So the glimpse will give us this uh, low resolution image. And the neural network will look at this and suggest another position to look at, x2, y2. So we do a couple of 
more times and then maybe after a finite number of glimpses like five glimpses we basically say okay you've had enough time now use a softmax to give me your prediction okay so as you can imagine this network has a lot fewer weights especially if the image is very high resolution compared to a, um, doing this with a fully you know with a deep CNN model Um, there was an animation that's not working here um, of how these glimpses worked, but I uh, encourage you to look at this paper. Uh, another example of policy gradient methods is AlphaGo. AlphaGo used a lot of almost all the ideas that I mentioned before and more. So. Um, it used Monte Carlo tree search, which is basically um, sampling moves from the game tree uh, in order to create targets for a reinforcement learner uh, to learn. Um, the original version initialized its training using expert games. Uh, then they came up with AlphaGo Zero this year, which doesn't use any human games whatsoever and starts everything from scratch and uh, learns even better. Um, and the only input AlphaGo gets is basically plus one, minus one for winning and losing at the end of the game, which can take hundreds of moves in a typical game of Go. Okay, so very little uh, feedback, and very indirect feedback. Okay, so to summarize our whole uh, reinforcement learning with neural networks lecture. Uh, we learned about, we already knew about Q learning, and we found out that we can actually apply Q learning and Bellman equation type updates to neural networks. They basically act just like uh, supervised targets for neural networks. Uh, we saw policy gradients, which we didn't actually, um, I don't think we saw the analog of that before. We always actually always um, work with the value functions. So policy gradients and the reinforced algorithm are different in that they only represent the policy uh, with parameters. But it turns out you can actually improve the efficiency of policy networks a lot if you pair them with um, a value network. So using them both uh, in an approach called actor critic um, improves the convergence. Uh, there's a lot more information in David Silver's notes, especially about convergence, which ones of these things converge, which ones not. Uh, as a very high level summary, I can say that the simple table uh, algorithms and linear models usually converge in these things. Uh, but when, as soon as you get to nonlinear models like neural networks, you lose all the convergence guarantees. So in particular, uh, Q-learning uh, with Deep neural networks has no guarantees of convergence. It can actually oscillate, it can get out of control. Um, policy gradients, though, uh, do have a convergence guarantee, at least to a local minimum. And the reason of this non convergence is the sort of circular nature of uh, TD based methods. Right? So in, if you're using the Bellman equation and t, something like TD, you're saying my current value should be the immediate reward uh, plus the next value. But the next value is also something that you made up. So there is no real information coming into that um, uh, update other than the immediate reward. So that circularity makes most of the TD related um, algorithms not uh, converge with nonlinear function approximators. So that's all I have on reinforcement learning. <coughs>